What I want to have a look at this afternoon, as John said, is what the Lord's Prayer means to me. What it means both in the present and in terms of things to come in the case of the Kingdom. So we've just had read the Lord's Prayer, and I'm sure that it will be quite familiar to most of you, uh, even those of you that aren't members here, because I think it is possibly the most popular or at least the most well-known prayer in the whole of the Bible. It used to be that children would recite the Lord's Prayer daily at school, but from what I can find out of asking a couple of people, this practice has pretty much died away. In fact, when I asked Charlotte about it, she didn't have a clue what the Lord's Prayer was, which perhaps is a failing of ours as well as the school. Um, however, for, yeah, for example, I talked to Charlotte, but uh, I suppose this just illustrates really the shift away from God and towards humanism and men's ideas, because a lot of schools now have prayers that they've made up for themselves uh, that they recite every day. So what then was the purpose of the Lord's Prayer when it was given? Well, it was given in response to a request from Jesus' disciples in Luke 11 verse 1, which is the other record of this prayer. And what they say is, uh, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now the common misconception here is that his disciples are asking Jesus to teach them how to say general prayers, which in fact they're not. If you look at the word that's translated as pray here, it's to supplicate or to pray earnestly for. And that definition is from Strong's Concordance. And this definition helped the prayer make a little bit more sense to me because I'd always wondered why there's no thanks to God in it. Um, but having learned what the disciples were actually asking, i.e. how do we make requests of God, then it made a little bit more sense that there's no thanks in it. So what I want to do this afternoon then, is have a look at four sections from this prayer and have a look, as I've said, what they mean to me, either from a physical perspective, from a spiritual perspective, or in the case of the Kingdom, a brief outline of what it will mean. Sections that I'm going to look at then are these, which I don't think you can see because it's actually darkened them rather than highlighted them. It says, the sections are, Our Father, Thy Kingdom come, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So let's start then with our Father. This is the way that we address God in this prayer. And I've got to say that since becoming a father myself, addressing the creator of heaven and earth in this way has really taken on a whole new perspective and actually really improved my relationship with him. The fact that I would do anything for my children the fact that it hurts me when I have to discipline them, and that deep love that means that there is nothing that I wouldn't forgive them. And just to think that God thinks that way about me is just so uplifting and heartening. And I know you might think that I've gone a bit too far then in transferring a human relationship into a relationship with God, but like all types, it's not perfect. A God Almighty as a Father is far far beyond what I could ever hope to be, but the basic essence is there, and I think that that's exactly as it should be. After all, why else would God allow himself to be referred to as a father by anyone except for Jesus? The reason is that he's given us a relationship that we as human beings can understand. We can look at our own fathers, and although they're not perfect, <coughs> it's a relationship that we can understand, even if we've had terrible childhoods, we can understand what a human father should be like. And even if they're not, then we have an understanding of what our relationship with God should be like. So how then do we come to address God as our father in a spiritual sense? We know, as Genesis 1 tells us, that God created the human race. So in that sense, we are, in a way, all entitled to call him father. But what about spiritually? We look at Romans 8 and verse 14. It says, for as many as led, are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And if we follow that from here on to Matthew 7 and verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So doing the will of the Father then is the same as being led by his Spirit. As an example from daily life, if your natural father is a man who does everything, in a spirit of kindness, 
and you're led by his example to do the same thing, then you're being led by his spirit and you're doing your father's will. So what does Mark say about those who shall be saved or shall enter the kingdom of heaven, as we've just read? In Mark 16, he that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. So if we follow those references through them, to their conclusion, all three of them, what we must do to, be address, to address God as a father is to believe and be baptised. And if we do that, then what can we expect from him if we come to address him as our father? Excuse me, I'm going to have to take off my jumper. I'm absolutely boiling. <laughs> So what can we expect from God if we come to call him our Father? Well, that takes us quite neatly onto the, section, onto the next section, which is thy kingdom come. So what then will the kingdom of God be? What is it that we're praying for when we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done? Well, for a start, the kingdom of God must be a kingdom that's established on the earth. We can tell this simply from the wording of the prayer as it says, thy kingdom come and not may we go to thy kingdom. So what I'm going to do now is look through a selection of beliefs from the Christadelphian Statement of Faith, which I've paraphrased a little bit, concerning the kingdom of God, and with each one give a couple of Bible verses to back it up. So the first point then, is that God will set up a kingdom on earth, which will overthrow all others, and they will become the kingdoms of God, ruled over by Jesus Christ. And the first verse that we'll look at is up on the board, which is the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 2 and verse 44, which says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to, to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. <clears throat> the second reference is Isaiah 2 and chapter 3 which says, And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So you can see from these two sections of the Bible, firstly that God will set up a kingdom that will stand forever and that will overthrow all other kingdoms. And secondly, that all nations will be changed to the kingdoms of God, as I've just said. After all, why else would they listen to a king and not learn war anymore or lift up sword against each other if they weren't under his dominion? They would, it would be completely ridiculous to listen to someone who's not ruling over you to do these things. Just as an aside, this is also telling us that the kingdom of God is not yet here, as this state of affairs is not in the world at the moment. There are still plenty of wars all over the place. So the next important point about the kingdom of God then is that it will be the former kingdom of Israel restored in the territory that it formerly occupied. That being the, <laughs> the current country of Israel, although it will cover a slightly larger, well, a bit larger area than it does at the moment. It will cover the land of Israel that the children took when they came out, the children of Israel took when they came out of Egypt. This is the land promised for an everlasting possession to Abraham and his seed by covenant in Genesis at 15. We will look at a couple of Bible references for this. Galatians 3 verse 16 says that now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And then the second reference here is Ezekiel 37 and verse 21. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I shall make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more. So we can see this time then that the promised 
God made to Abraham in Genesis 15 that he would inherit the land he was in. We can see then, yeah. And then verse 18 of the chapter where he's told his seed will also inherit the land. We're told in, in these, the first of these two references then that this seed refers to Jesus Christ. And from the reference that we looked at, the second one in Ezekiel, that all the children of Israel, who are now known as the Jews, will be gathered from all over the world and back into their own land. As I said, occupying a territory larger than the current state of Israel. The final point then that I want to make here is that the government will eventually be delivered up by Jesus, who will be ruling over this kingdom of God, and handed over to God himself, who will manifest himself as all in all, sin and death having been taken out of the way. And we've only got one reference for this, I think we really only need one, which is 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24, which as you can see says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under his feet, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all which is basically a very wordy way of saying that God, Jesus, will hand, Jesus will have rule over everything except God, uh, but then he will hand all of the rule over to God. Now this, this longer reference ties up a few Christadel, the few Christadelphian beliefs that we've had a chance to look at. But you can see from this that Christ will reign until sin and death are put down and are no more, at which point he will hand over all power and authority to God, who will be all in all. And I'm sorry, I've only really had a chance to put down the bare bones on the subject of the kingdom. Uh, already this, this uh, section's run on longer than any of the others. So if you're interested, then ask one of us or help, help yourself to some of our literature. So back to the Lord's Prayer then. Give us this day our daily bread. Now the first thing that you want to note from this is that we're not told to ask for lots of different foods. We're told to ask for bread. Not as part of a sandwich or toast on the side of a big breakfast. Bread is an essential. It's not a luxury. So what we're being told here is not to pray for luxuries. A new house, a new car, a holiday. But only for those things which are essential. But I suppose that we all have different things that we see as essential. For myself, if I'm asking for the very bare essentials, I'm asking for food, drink, safety for me and my family. And I don't think there's anything else, if I'm really, really trying to keep it down to the very bare minimum, that I need to pray for. But again, as with the section on our Father, the first section is focused only on the physical. There is, after all, another type of bread, and that is spiritual bread. Which is what Christ refers to in John chapter 6, verse 35, when he says, I am the... I am the bread of life, but he that cometh to me shall never hung he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He was of course talking spiritually when he refers to himself as bread, because he was quite clearly not actual bread. This is the other essential that we should have in mind when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. That we should grow a little stronger spiritually by taking in his words and teaching, just as we grow stronger physically by taking in literal bread. Another thing to note about this phrase, give us this day our daily bread, is that we're just asking for the essentials for this day. We're not planning out weeks in advance what we may or may not need. Jesus says in Matthew 6, a little later on in the chapter that we've had read, in verse 34, Take therefore no, heed for to no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I think, however, that the English Standard Version of the Bible translates it a little more understandably when it says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So 
So it's about what's praying. It's about praying for what's needed for us today, not for vast amounts of material things in the vague future. And I think this simple line, "Give us this day our daily bread," for me sums up really the essence of the Lord's Prayer. There are times when we might wish to go to God, laying out all of our problems, asking for lots of things, thanking Him for lots of things. But this isn't the prayer for that. This is a straightforward prayer. And I don't say that in any way to demean this beautiful prayer. Because it says everything necessary. It's a simple prayer. But its beauty is in its simplicity. So finally then. Oh, I've missed out those references. Whoops. Finally then, we'll go on to forgiveness. The final section of the Lord's Prayer that I want to look at is forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I think the basic sentiment of this section is quite obvious to us just from the words on the page. What I want to do is have a look at where these ideas are backed up in the rest of the Bible. For example, if you look at Matthew 18, verse 24 to 35, which I've asked John to read, we have this parable. So if you'd like to read that for us, John. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who went to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into a prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was being done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. We've got in this parable servants, masters and denarii. And does that mean much to you? Because I'll be honest, if I didn't read the Bible regularly, it wouldn't mean much to me because we don't tend to have servants and masters and we definitely don't have denarii. Although Gina handles the money, so maybe we do actually. <laughs> Could be. But anyway, it's difficult to capture the scope of this parable if you don't really understand the terms. So let's try and turn this into a story that is a bit more relatable. So there was once a man, who's a stock trader we'll say, and he runs up tens of millions of pounds of debt with the company that he works for. He's in utter despair. He thinks that he's going to lose everything. He thinks he's going to lose his house, his job, his car. He thinks his family will be turned out onto the street and he thinks that he will be thrown into prison. His boss summons him to the company head office. They discuss this debt and all the things that the man fears are going to come true. He begs and pleads with his boss and to his huge surprise, his boss writes off the debt. He's forgiven. And all of that pressure, all of that weight, and all of that fear is lifted from the man's shoulders. 
On the way home, however, he receives an email saying that a tenant leasing a property that he owns has missed a weekly rent payment. So on the way home, he stops in, and despite the tenant's pleading and begging, he assaults the tenant, throws his wife and two young children out onto the street, and drags the tenant down to the police station. Upon hearing this, the man's boss reinstates the huge debt and has him thrown into prison. And when we hear this story, we're quite naturally astounded and even angry at the reaction of this man to having his huge that the reaction of this man to having his huge debt forgiven is then to go and demand payment from somebody else. But I really think that we need to stop and think because this could easily be us. Think of the huge debt that God has forgiven us when we sin or when we break God's laws. We're told in Romans 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin are death. So when God forgives us, he saves our lives. He gets rid of a huge debt. And yet what petty grievances do we hold against others? What smaller debts do we repeatedly demand payment for rather than forgive and let go? After all, we're told in Matthew 7 and verse 2, For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it will be measured to you again. So if we follow that through then, if our standard of judgment is to not forgive, then we will not be forgiven ourselves. So do we think that we just need to forgive once? And that's it, we'll be forgiven indefinitely. Well, Jesus makes it plain that this isn't the case. As, as we've just read, it's a, this parable is a response to Peter asking this very question. Peter asking, how often should I forgive my brother? And Jesus says effectively that there is no limit, there should be no limit to our forgiveness. And if we master this, then there will be no limit to God's forgiveness of us either. And that's that one. Having looked then at these few parts of the Lord prayer, the Lord's Prayer, we've seen a few of, few of the blessings that God provides for those who follow him. Firstly, we've seen the ability to call God a Father. Secondly, a place in his kingdom. Thirdly, daily provision for both the spiritual and physical. And finally, forgiveness of our sins. So I hope that what we've seen is rather than just something that we've learnt to recite off by heart, or we may have learnt at school, the Lord's Prayer has real value in our lives today. Thank you.